Yeah. You've heard a lot about wearables in, uh, in recent times, and I'll shed a little bit of light on that um, later on in the presentation. I did want to start, actually, by talking a little bit about, well, first, ABI, but also uh, smartphones, um, because smartphones will, will remain the hub of, of the mobile uh, computing industry for the foreseeable future, uh, and obviously uh, wearables are often uh, or typically will be an accessory to, to smartphones. So we'll talk a little bit about smartphones first and what's happening in, in that industry. Um, but first, uh, uh, Ryan's already introduced you uh, to me, so I'll just talk a little bit about ABI research. Uh, obviously, we're an analyst firm, um, you know, much like the Gartners and IDCs of this world. ABI's uh, USP, I would say, is... Um, really looking at the components and the supply chain of the industry. So we're very much looking at the technologies themselves and what they then may enable. So we're, we're looking further back in the chain rather than necessarily um, uh, kind of box counting uh, and looking at, at what's selling. Um, so we're looking at what's next. That said, um, in my uh, first section, uh, we're going to talk quite a, li a lot about the mobile handset market. Uh, and, the, and the foundation of that will be uh, you know, looking at the numbers, so what's selling. Uh, and what's going to be selling next as well. Um, so yeah, as I said, talk a little bit about the numbers, some of the key vendors, uh, and what we might expect over the, uh, over the coming months. Uh, so your kind of immediate decision making uh, and, and uh, you know, volume orders and things like that. Um, and you know, there's, there's actually a lot going on there. I mean, you're, you're seeing a number of victims uh, in the OEM space. You know, some very, uh, some, uh, you know, big names uh, are suffering, uh, one of which uh, I'm an alumni of, in fact. Um, so, uh, so moving on, I think you know, let's take a, a macro view uh, at the market. Um, and Rudy from GFK uh, showed you this uh, diagram, and, and I no doubt you're quite familiar with uh, what is the, uh, the technology diffusion um, uh, cycle. Um, Rudy showed you uh, th this curve with, uh, with Jeffrey Moore's uh, kind of imagery overlaid in it, things like the chasm, the gorilla, the tornado, bowling alley. Um, you know, he puts on the different stages uh, of, of the diffusion cycle, which are, uh, hopefully you can see here, are, uh, you know, the innovators, so the, the sort of techie geeks, um, and, and, you know, creators of technology, and then the early adopters moving to early majority, late majority, and, and laggards. Um, and what I've done in the, in the chart on top there is, is look at the installed base by, uh, as a percentage of population for each of the different regions. Um, so you can see, you know, Asia Pac, Africa, Central Eastern Europe, LATAM, Middle East, North America, and Western Europe, and then, and then uh, the whole worldwide population overall. And you know, the different stages, which are highlighted by the lines, show, you know, create different characteristics in the market. Um, once you get past 50%, uh, growth tends to slow, and margins tend to start getting uh, affected. Um, and, and ASPs as well start to, be, start to come under severe pressure. Uh, and as you can see here, you have over 50% uh, penetration of, of smartphones in, um, in North America and Western Europe. Uh, and Central and Eastern Europe isn't far behind, actually. The, this, the, these slides are about three months old, so Q4 was a fairly dramatic uh, quarter for, uh, for Central and Eastern Europe. So they'll be up to 50% uh, probably this quarter. Um, and that means that you know, in Western Europe, it means that most uh, contract uh, subscribers have already got a smartphone, so that's a replacement market, and then you're into the more cost-conscious prepay market, so ASPs will come under pressure. Um, so that characterizes, I think, the different regions. One thing I would say about this is that one of the key elements here and the reasons ASPs are under pressure is because the affluent population is largely penetrated. So you're now looking at growth in a, in a less affluent, uh, you know, either less, less, less affluent uh, markets or less affluent consumers, subscribers within, uh, other mar within the more advanced markets as well. Um, with that in mind, so growth has very much moved to uh, what you call, uh, what you know, we call emerging markets for want of a, a better phrase. Um, and you're seeing here, obviously, that is very much driven by uh, Asia Pacific. Uh, most notably China and, and India. And while, while none of the others are actually experiencing negative growth, um, you're looking at 5 to 10% uh, growth rather than previously it was 20, 30, 40, sometimes even more, even higher. Um, so, you know, the majority of the growth is, is in Africa and uh, Asia Pacific um, over the next few years. Um, and what, what becomes interesting here is that the smartphone industry was very much geared and, and targeting Western markets, so Western Europe, North America. 
uh, now that the volume is moving towards China and India particularly, you're going to start seeing that products are actually more focused and content that is consumed on those products is moves towards Chinese and Indian markets. And in fact, it's already moved to Chinese and, uh, and to some degree Indian manufacturers as well. Um, so they're becoming very influential uh, on the market, both in terms of consumption and, and already in, in supply. Um, and you can see the populations uh, there. It's, it's no great surprise. So the pie chart in the, in the uh, bottom right, as you look at it, um, you know, shows the population. And obviously, Asia-Pac has three-fifths of the world's population, uh, so an enormous market that, in a, in a way, I think, is, is uh, both underserved and underconsidered, uh, particularly by uh, Western companies. Um, another thing that's characterized uh, the mobile handset market broadly, uh, as, as you probably noted from me talking about smartphones, is the shift to, to smartphones. Uh, and that has very much accelerated in the last year or so as average selling prices have dropped, uh, mainly driven by, by uh, Chinese manufacturers uh, and component suppliers as well, which we'll talk about a little bit more later. Um, so, I mean, that's one of the key things. And you're seeing you know, quite a high penetration now, well over 50%. Uh, of handset shipments are smartphones globally. Uh, that for, uh, they, they first became the majority, smartphones became the majority uh, in Q2 2013, so quite recently, but they're now already north of 60% um, of, of the overall handset market. Uh, so that gives you an enormous installed base with which to work with. Um, and that you know, obviously is a key driver and enabler for wearables, which we'll talk about uh, in a moment. And, and as I've said, you know, the, the opportunity really is in the low end. Uh, and when I, when I say low end, obviously that is relative to the market that you're, uh, that you're targeting. So in, in uh, Europe, uh, that would be sub $200 or 200 euros, let's say. Um, uh, and in, in places like Africa and parts uh, of Asia, it would probably be sub, it's sub 50. Um, so, but, but you know, that's, that's, that's where the growth is and the rest of the market is a replacement market. Um, I don't want to sort of panic you. Obviously, there are significant volumes still at the higher end, uh, and the replacement market, you know, typically people are replacing devices every 18 to 24 months. Um, so that's still a, you know, a very good volume market. And the, you know, handsets are uh, the largest consumer electronic market in the world. So we're talking enormous volumes here. And as you can see, we're actually talking in billions. Um, so by 2015, you're looking at 2 billion handsets um, sold every year. Uh, so we're talking enormous volumes here. Um, let's talk a little bit about the vendors and how that landscape has changed in recent times. Um, we've seen some very well-publicized uh, uh, vendors struggling, some huge brands that have been absolute cornerstone of the market. Uh, I'm thinking about Nokia, uh, BlackBerry, to some degree HTC as well. Um, and you've seen in recent times it become well, I mean, there's a lot of color on this chart. You know, it has become quite a binary market, particularly uh, on, on uh, you know, subsidized contract uh, sales. Um, you know, again, that's you know, Western Europe, North America, and, and those pockets of advanced Asia. Um, but, uh, and, and so you've seen those two, two vendors, particularly, really forge ahead of the others, Apple and Samsung, uh, particularly at the high end, but Samsung also Throughout, throughout the different price points that they play in as well, have become very dominant. Uh, and you can see Samsung in the orange, by the way, and, uh, and Apple at the bottom in the sort of dark gray. Um, and as you know, Apple don't play uh, below the, the $500 mark. Um, so, so that limits their volume, but not, not, certainly not their profit. Um, the other thing to look at here is, is the, the blue section at the top. Uh, so that's others. Uh, and we've broken out a number of Chinese vendors in, in here. Uh, the ones to look at are uh, Xiaomi, ZTE, uh, Huawei uh, particularly, but also um, TCL as well uh, as, a, as a low cost vendor. Um, so these are interesting vendors to look at. And, and one thing I'd, I'd talk about, so I, I talk about the Chinese vendors. Uh, that is a mistake in itself. Um, you need to start thinking about the different types of vendors that China has to offer. Um, you know, the stereotype that everything's low cost is, is a dangerous one. Um, you know, Xiaomi particularly has, has a, a lot of innovation in, in its, in its go-to-market strategy. The way they work with their community, they, they, they sell directly and they constantly communicate uh, with, their, with their users and, and push services onto their devices. Um, it, and, and I think that's a, an interesting reflection of how the market is going. It's quite hard to monetize directly just through hardware uh, and make, make a profit, that is. Uh, the way to do it is to actually retain your customer 
have a, have a relationship with them and constantly have, uh, push services out to them. Uh, and that's something that we'll talk about a bit later. And that goes, I think, uh, you know, even, even for retailers, but all brands need to start thinking about this 24-7 relationship with their customer. And there's things like Web 2.0 that influence that as well. But you want to, you want to retain that relationship and keep um, you know, the replacement cycle going. And that goes across all industries, I think. Um, I th one, one thing I would add, though, so people talk about Samsung and Apple's dominance. Well, they are increasingly coming under pressure, um, partly because of the saturation at the high end, um, but also because you know, the innovation curve, which you know, typically has that S-curve shape, is beginning to get to the top of the S-curve. Um, and that means that if you're not constantly innovating, it means that those people that are the fast followers that have manufacturing expertise start to catch up. Uh, and we'll talk about the phenomenon that, that really uh, embodies that is, is something called reference designs that we'll talk about in a second. And it's something that's happened in other consumer electronic categories as well. I mean, many of you will be familiar um, you know, on, on both TVs, things like set-top boxes, and even PCs to, uh, have become effective reference designs, which are just turnkey solutions, and all you need to do is assemble the hardware. Um, but we'll talk about that a little bit further. Um, but you see, you know, the margins for Apple are, are reducing slightly. I mean, they're, they're still extraordinarily profitable with an enormous cash pile that, that will be very interesting to see what they do uh, with that in the coming quarters. But I think things like the Apple 5C, the iPhone 5C, what, what is the point in that device? Um, it, it's only, what, 100 euros cheaper than the 5S. So on contract, it ends up being around five to six euros a month people will stretch to get the 5S, and that has been pr proven to be the case. I think 70 or 80% of Apple's uh, iPhone sales in the last quarter were the 5S. That, that to me, is a confused product. Um, and and it, it concerns me about you know, what the ideas uh, that are coming out of Apple are at the moment when they, when they produce a product like that. That said, I'm sure they'll shift a lot of devices. Uh, 51.2 million devices in, in Q4 last year, and they've just signed a deal with China Mobile. So they have no issues with volume in the short term, but longer term, they need to come up with some more innovation. Um, obviously, we're at uh, Distri Emir, so I, I wanted to show a uh, Central Eastern uh, Europe and Western Europe uh, view. Uh, not dramatically different, uh, as you can see, uh, but I would say that because Central Eastern Europe is largely uh, uns uns unsubsidized, uh, independent uh, distribution and retail, so not operator uh, uh, controlled, um, you see a little bit more variety, lower ASP, Apple don't do as, as, as well, uh, and you see a lot more others as well. When, when you don't have the operators as a gatekeeper to a market, um, you, tend to, you tend to find that, uh, that you know, market entry is easier for different brands and people are more cost conscious and less brand conscious. Um, so that's, that's why you see you know, more Chinese vendors having an impact there. But you will see the Chinese vendors having more of an impact in Western Europe as well. Huawei, ZTE, Lenovo now after the Motorola acquisition clearly have international ambitions. Um, and you will see them impacting the markets more. Brand is still an issue, but that's something that, that will, will, uh, will improve gradually just as it did with Samsung in the 90s and early noughties. Okay. Um, Briefly on operating systems, uh, clearly Android very much dominates the, the low end um, and, and, and the volume uh, play, and that's because they dominate, uh, they dominate the reference design market. Um, so that, that's where we are in terms of, so AOSP is an interesting phenomenon that is forked Android, where people are layering on their own services. Um, and that's something that's a concern for Google because they can't monetize those services. They can't push their own services on top of, on top of Android. Um, uh, I'd also say that things like HTML5, frankly, haven't delivered on the promise. It's a very fragmented world, still HTML5. Uh, and when you speak to most developers, they say it's just as hard to develop for HTML5 as it is to go native with, with uh, operating systems like Android or iPhone. Okay. Uh, a little bit about reference design. So uh, as the innovation curve flattens, um, it becomes easier for people to, to simply integrate a lot more technology into the components. And this really is what Qualcomm uh, and now MediaTek uh, even more so have done. So what they're doing is they're layering on services and software onto their chipsets. Um, uh, so therefore, the OEM, the, the, the manufacturer, the handset manufacturer, no longer needs to do that complex integration. Uh, so what it means is that a very basic 
uh, manufacturer or assembly line can now start producing smartphones. And so it, you know, that's commoditization, effectively. Um, so you're seeing prices drop dramatically. Um, and that has a huge impact on, on the whole market, uh, you know, inclu including Samsung. Um, so if you don't own more than just the hardware, you're going to, you're going to come under pressure. Um, so you need to either own some content or you need to own something in the supply chain. And that's really how you're seeing the industry shake out. Those that don't own adjacent parts of the, the value chain, the stack, are struggling. Okay. Um, a quick summary of, of, of what I've talked about, but uh, I'm slightly pushed for time, so I'll, I'll, I'll go over this uh, or, or uh, you know, quickly go on. Um, let's talk a little bit about uh, multi-device. Um, so in recent times, you've seen the space between smartphone and PC be become to uh, fill, fill up. Um, first netbooks, then tablets, and now you're seeing phablets come in, uh, and now wearables as well. And then you're seeing the combinations of detachables uh, and convertibles uh, in the PC space. So it's getting pretty complicated for you in terms of the SKUs. Add in the fact that they, ha they have a variety of operating systems, and that the nice, easy Wintel PC notebook world uh, seems a distant memory. Um, and I think one thing to consider here is that people are going to start using these devices in combination, and they already do. So tablet users, uh, device, uh, smartphone users often have another device, uh, and tablet users typically have three devices. Uh, so I'd say as a retailer, you need to start thinking about what the use cases are with combinations of devices. Uh, so is it smartwatch, uh, smartphone, and, and PC? Or you know, what are the different combinations that they might be using? And, and coming up with profiles and use cases for those device combinations. Um, and I think part of that uh, will also be things like easy shared data plans. I mean, in the US at the moment, with, with I think Verizon, you have to pay $20 to add a new device. That's quite a big hurdle and an obstacle. I would suggest you need to be more flexible um, than that to encourage people to, to build in and, and have their devices and connect their devices. I mean, the numbers on connected tablets are very low at the moment, the attach rate. Even if, you, even if it is 3G or, or LTE uh, uh, enabled, people often don't actually uh, make, make that connection. So that's something, something to think about. Um, I'd also say accessories are a great opportunity because they, they optimize the mobile experience. You know, a good pair of headphones makes people want to listen to music much more than a rubbish pair of headphones, as a very simple example. So that's also something to think about. Um, and making all of this work for you means that you need to have analytics behind what the user is doing on these devices and identity management. So you know that it's one person using three devices and you need to be able to understand what the use case is, where they are, how they're connected on these devices to make sure that you are retaining that customer and, make, and servicing them and getting ROI on any kind of subsidy or financing investment that you have. And I realize operators dominate subsidy, but they don't have to. It is just financing. Um, just like on cars, anyone can do it. Um, okay, quickly on wearables, I've, I haven't got much time. So, you're hearing a lot about wearables at the moment, and, and you know, I would have a word of warning that I think what you're seeing at the moment is very much wearables 1.0. Things are going to advance significantly in the next year. Components are in a, posi uh, in a much better position than they were a year ago, which are the components that are in the current products. Um, and you, know, you, have, you have this installed base of smartphones as well to utilize, that, that's been the case, and it's increasing in, in every market. Um, but the quality of the components has, has increased a lot, and I'm talking about uh, particularly the chipsets, because the chipset vendors, I mean, if you've been watching, this is their focus for 2014. You are going to see significant advances from the chipset vendors. And what they're doing is they're, they're, they're creating a system on a chip, almost a, a device on a chip. So you can, in, in, you can in, in, uh, in, you know, integrate that into almost any kind of device. Um, so you're going to see a huge variety of wearables, some of which you saw on stage yesterday. But those will advance very quickly. And so what you're seeing at the, at the moment, I think, are quite limited in their capabilities, and you're going to see a lot more integration of technologies and open source, so uh, open source operating systems on these devices, which will enable a lot more use cases. And a key element to this is user interface. So we're very much dominated by a touchscreen user interface at the moment. But for wearables to work, you're going to start looking at gesture, eye tracking, and voice. And a lot of the chipsets today enable that, that always on uh, sensors that will enable those kinds of UIs. 
Uh, and that's absolutely key to enabling the, the wearable space and moving away, I think, just from, from the touchscreen um, uh, UI experience. Uh, power management is a key element of that. And you're also seeing, um, you know, I don't know if you know big little uh, chipset architectures where you choose which chipset to use for the different um, for the, for the performance requirements of whichever feature or application you're using. So you don't use a huge, it's a bit like using a huge engine that needs a lot of petrol for a little task. That's what we used to do. We don't do that anymore. Okay. Um, so you're seeing a profusion of different uh, categories, and there's a lot more than this. This is just the devices, so the actual pieces of the hardware. Um, but I'd say smartwatches have been uh, typically disappointing to date uh, in their use case. I mean, just having alerts on your wrist um, is not an enormous leap from just taking your uh, smartphone out of your pocket, especially when you can't act on some of the things that you're being alerted by, uh, which is a problem. And I'd also say the aesthetic design of watches is important and not up to speed um, currently. Most people wear a watch as a fashion item rather than as a technology gadget. Um, so you, either you need that to come together or you need to think of different a different target market. So you're not looking at the, the fashion watch market, which is what watches are about, you're looking at a, a, you know, a technology market. Um, I think smart watches is where it's at really at the moment, and they start becoming interesting when they become more of a hybrid. So you're building in sports and fitness trackers, health monitors, and the alerts that are, that are typical on something like the Galaxy Gear. Um, and that, that, that is available now, and that will advance uh, very quickly. And I think with new screen technologies, you'll see curved screens uh, and more screen real estate, which, which then is in step with the fact that uh, most screens are getting larger. Uh, and that's a problem with some of the current offerings with these tiny LCD alert uh, screens at the bottom of the watch face. Um, so we're seeing a profusion, really, of different categories. Uh, and that causes a lot of complexity. Like we talked about all the different kinds of computing devices, you have a lot of SKUs or you know, different of device categories to think about and to consider. Um, and you're also, because of this, the new chipset architectures, which adds this simplicity into the hardware uh, manufacture, you're going to see all sorts of different manufacturers entering the space. Uh, so I already mentioned Intel with Edison, which is the chipset you see there. Uh, but MediaTek are rumored to be launching a, a low-cost uh, chipset as well called Aster. Um, it's, it's on the internet, so I'm not giving anything away. Um, and that means you're a huge profusion of uh, manufacturers. Uh, but you'll also see you know, consumer electronic devices moving into lots of different retail environments, um, which, uh, which adds complexity to you. But you, you know, initially, it will be the usual suspects. It'll be Samsung, perhaps Apple in the near future. You know, people that can make a market and have the brand uh, and, and manufacturing capacity uh, to, and retailing influence to be able to push these things into the market. But soon, you'll see all sorts of people pushing these devices into the market. Um, so in a way, it's, it's a bit like uh, you know, the chipsets here, a bit like APIs were for operating systems. They're opening up, making, creating hardware to, to, to almost anyone. OK, quick conclusions. So like I said, the opportunity is enormous. You know, making these smart accessories or wearables uh, and attaching them to your smartphone creates a premium experience, which is great for service providers, but also a tremendous you know, upsell opportunity for you. Um, many of the current wearables are not quite ready, so I'd be wary about you know, ordering how, your volume, which I know will upset some people, perhaps, here. Um, but like I said, there's going to be a huge development year here. It's almost smartphones have been on a hyper development cycle, but I would suggest wearables will be even faster. You know, people, the big guns have their sights on this market now, and we'll see a lot of activity here in the coming year. I think UI advances are going to be very interesting and are a key enabler. But I also think not just in wearables, but they will actually also move into other consumer electronics uh, categories as well. Uh, so it won't just be touch on, on lots of devices. Uh, and even the remote control on your TV might start to look quite dated. Um, I think a lot of the current smartwatch vendors uh, may struggle due to the, some of the designs, the proprietary operating systems they use, uh, and just the limited screen size they currently have. Uh, like I said, the chipset manufacturers are kind of the king makers here. You know, they are opening up the market to all sorts of different innovations uh, as well. And, and as, as, as I mentioned on the previous slide, expect a lot of manufacturers and a lot of brands, not just consumer electronic brands. You're going to see all sorts of fashion brands, sports brands, um, you know, coming in and using wearables and getting into this market. 
because the barrier to entry both on smartphones and on wearables has become significantly lower due to reference design chipsets. So you're going to see a lot of people into the market, which adds, again, complexity to your lives in terms of who you're dealing with. Admittedly, they may well be made by the same uh, ODM manufacturer, but they will have different brands on these devices. Okay, so, it, I mean, variety, I think, is probably the, the watchword in the future, and the fact that the consumer electronic market is opening up uh, to others and barrier to entry is lowering. So it doesn't really help you in terms of SKUs and, and ordering, uh, you know, and who you have to deal with. But that's it from me. So uh, thanks for your time, and I'll hand back to, to Ryan.